On today's Apple Daily, how Apple could solve the Rosetta issue. Square buys Tidal, Spotify announced Hi-Fi, what's your move Apple? More on Apple's Mac Pro Mini, Adobe and M1, best iPhone under $100, and long-term iPhone use. For the latest Apple news, rumors, and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. I'm Mike Dave, David, and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks, and rumors every weekday at 12 UTC, you're in the right place. Now, I've been checking out our statistics and about 80% of the people watching this video probably haven't subscribed. So if you like a bit of Apple news, make sure that you hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so that you don't miss a thing and you can join our notification squad, just like Hashim Usman, and you could be the next person to get a shout out. And while we're here, I just wanted to do a quick bit of housekeeping. There is a reason that I've not been at the premieres for the last few days. Uh, we had a couple of days off a couple of weeks ago, and that was because uh, my eldest son was at the hospital um, normally. We tend to be at the hospital for my youngest son, who has leukemia. This time we were at the hospital for my eldest son, who has just been diagnosed now with uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes, which means that we have to inject him with insulin, and he's gone back to school, uh, but that means that we have to pop into the school at midday to administer said insulin just at the moment. So what I'm going to do to make sure that I can be at the premieres is I'm going to push our shows back to 12.30pm instead of 12pm just for a week uh, from Monday. We'll see how that goes. Um, let me know if that's awful for you. For some reason you can't make it at that time. Let me know in the comments. But uh, that's what I would like to do just for a week uh, at least to begin with and see how it goes because I do enjoy chatting with you live. But that being out of the way, let's get on with the show. How Apple could solve the Rosetta issue. So yesterday I touched on the story around what's going on with Apple's Mac OS 11.3 Big Sur beta and the code that was found around Rosetta 2 no longer being available in your region. And as yet it's not fully clear what issue it is as Apple has been refusing to comment as usual. However, a 2017 blog post on Intel's own website may shed some light on this. It starts, however, there have been some reports that companies may try to emulate Intel's proprietary x86 ISA without Intel's authorization. Emulation is not a new technology and Transmeta was notably the last company to claim to have produced a compatible x86 processor using emulation or code morphing techniques. Intel enforced patents regarding to SIMD instruction set enhancements against Transmeta's x86 implementation, even though it had been used in emulation. In any event, Transmeta was not commercially successful and exited the microprocessor business 10 years ago. So I think if this is the case, I wonder if Apple might have to throw some more resources at having some of their own engineers supporting developers making universal binaries on the fly. They said that optimizing could be done very quickly for most apps, in fact like in less than an hour for some apps, so it would be great to see Apple get involved in pushing that through. Otherwise there might be something that Apple can do with the translation side of things before apps even go into the App Store that could ease the issue, but it will be interesting to see what happens with this. Fingers crossed we get to keep Rosetta for a bit longer. Square buys Tidal, Spotify announced Hi-Fi, so what's your move Apple? Twitter owner Jack Dorsey's Square has bought a majority stake in Jay-Z's Tidal streaming platform which focuses on uncompressed master tracks for $279 million. Jay-Z will join the board of directors at Square as a result of this deal and it comes weeks after Spotify announced their own high fidelity streaming service that will launch later this year. So the question remains, what is Apple going to do? Now it's clear that Apple hasn't lost its focus on music being at the core of their business, especially after the AirPods Max late in 2020, which makes great use of Apple's own AAC compression to give great sound compared to Spotify and the others using compressed streaming audio. However, having access to uncompressed audio, even if only through a $35 cable, would be a big win for the platform. And let's be honest, anyone complaining about a $35 cable has no right to call themselves an audiophile. Have you seen how expensive their cables are? More on Apple's Mac Pro Mini. Apple Silicon really is one of the most exciting things going on right now, and the Mac Pro will be the most exciting thing that Apple can bring to the table 
in terms of their own silicon. That's assuming that that's the name that they stick with. I'm very much wondering if they resurrect the Power Mac name for these, and I think it would be an awesome move. John Prosser leaked some details recently, and Apple Tomorrow, that Saad who does all of our rendering stuff, has put together some amazing renders based on that look. Now, we've been told that it will evoke the feel of the Power Mac G4 Cube, and I see what they mean. In terms of the way that the Cube worked at the time too, it was fanless and had a unified thermal core. The thermal core is not unlike what we saw in the Trashcan Mac Pro from 2013, which was not so popular. Can't innovate my ass. My thoughts are that this would be semi-modular. Semi -modular. My thoughts are that this would be semi-modular, and I've mentioned before the idea that the system might well something that resembles like a games cartridge for swapping out modules. They could easily enough have airflow vents that run through them to guide the flow. That would allow for adding specific cards for music studios, afterburner cards for video editors, additional internal fast storage, and more. Mark Gurman has mentioned that Apple has been developing almost obscenely powerful Apple Silicon processors ready for these with up to 32 high-performance Firestorm cores that the M1 has just four of right now and still performs incredibly well. Add to that between 64 and 128 GPU cores instead of the eight in the M1 or seven in some of the Airs, and you're gonna be looking at an absolute beast of a system here. It's really gonna be exciting to see what they come out with. I'm hoping that we get a glimpse at WWDC this year too. Let me know what you think about when we'll be seeing that and also which Apple Silicon Mac you are most excited for down in the comments. Right, next we're gonna get into some iCave answers. Uh, first of all, the Duke of Kidderminster. iCave answers, is there any more information around regarding M1 compatible updates for the Adobe applications? Now, one of the things about the Adobe stuff is they've got quite a few of their uh, programs already in beta. So Photoshop, for example, is already there in beta. I believe they've now done a beta for Adobe Premiere. Uh, Lightroom is already working. Um, there are a few other bits obviously out there. So there's things like After Effects, which I don't think is uh, M1 compatible yet. Uh, so you'd be using the M1 um, Intel emulation, which is a worrying prospect at this point. But Adobe does seem to be quite committed to actually bringing all of their apps over in a pretty quick time scale. Um, I'd be interested to know which particular apps you were thinking of. Um, I don't think uh, anyone uses Dreamweaver anymore. Is that still a thing? I know Flash is gone now. Um, I know they've got a huge kind of suite with the Rush and all that kind of thing. But yeah, uh, it's certainly on the way. Um, and I've been using the Adobe Photoshop beta software on my Mac Mini for doing pretty much all the graphics for the show uh, since the first day that we got it. Next up, Mikey asks, I gave answers. What is the best iPhone to get in 2021? I don't want to spend more than $100 because that is a lot of money. I have an iPhone 3GS uh, and I'm not sure if I should get an iPhone 4 or an iPhone 12 in 10 years when it's cheaper. Please don't recommend me an Android. I had an Android and they stole my information. Recommend me a good phone under $100. I can't pay more than that because I'm on a budget. Please recommend. I love you, I Cave Dave. Well, I am very lovable, so that's very much understandable. But on the topic of a $100 sub iPhone, um, so we're not going we're not going to recommend you any Android stuff because that would just be um, uh, I think a breach of human rights. I had a quick look on eBay and obviously I'm here in the UK so I looked in pounds so I've just converted it straight over to £100. I know that's not the same amount of money. All the Apple stuff tends to come out at the same number of money in the UK and the US so we'll assume that the pricing kind of matches up that way. But you can get yourself an iPhone 7 for under £100. Obviously you're going to be buying used at this point and you might need to get yourself uh, a new battery at some point in the nearish future but those can be picked up quite cheaply as long as you're able to repair them yourself. When you're on a budget like this, you will need to do some of these things on your own. But the iPhone 7 will currently run iOS 14, um, which is the current version of the software. So that's a great thing. Check out some of Tech Hype's videos because he actually tests pretty much every beta on an iPhone 7, I believe, as and when they appear. He's really, really good and really hot on the iOS betas. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, definitely check him out. Just quickly while we're on the subject of iOS betas, I am using 14.5 uh, on my main iPhone now. The mask unlock feature is really, really good. But with an iPhone 7, you won't have to worry about any of that. You will be able to do Apple Pay on your phone. You will be able to use the Touch ID and it is the solid state Touch ID that doesn't 
physically move and it's really good um it's a decent phone you shouldn't have any problems with it but that would be my recommendation an iphone 7 if you guys have a different recommendation for under a hundred dollars let me know down in the comments and savik Murkaji asks iko dave do you recommend an average pro consumer like me use their iphones for at least five to six years given the older models always get that many years of software updates from Apple. And as far as speed goes, I've had a pretty good experience with them. Also, given that I can't go out every two to three years and pay that hefty amount for the newest models, but with every five to six years, yes, I can. What's your advice for me? Thanks, you're doing a great job. Well, thank you so much. Um, so what I would suggest is if you don't want to be paying out the full amount every year, uh, there are a couple of different options. Number one would be looking just after a new iPhone comes out. So when the iPhone 12 came out, look out for an iPhone 11 that is used, one that's been around for a year, and pick one of those up. And then at the end of that year, you can sell that one on and pick up an iPhone 12. So you kind of stay one year behind the cycle or two years behind the cycle, and you will always have a lower buy-in price and you will always have a decent chunk of that price still left the following year to trade it in. So you can actually probably keep a year or two behind the latest models and it will cost you maybe 50 to to $100 a year. Um, that would be a really efficient way of keeping quite current, but not 100% current. In terms of keeping an iPhone, like buying an iPhone brand new and then keeping it for five to six years, I think you're actually gonna miss out on a lot by doing it that way. You're gonna have a great phone for a year and then you're gonna have a fine phone for about three years and then you're gonna have a phone that's really kind of starting to struggle for the last couple of years. So I would say that staying one to two years behind the main releases and buying used is not a bad option. Um, especially if you're not too worried about scratches and things like that. If you're someone that uses a case, why do you care if the back of your phone's got scratches on it? It doesn't really matter. So that would be my advice actually, rather than trying to buy a phone and keep it for five to six years, buy the ones that everyone else are casting off after a couple of years and, uh, and stay on that cadence instead. Maybe you could keep those for two years so you end up with a four-year-old phone that you then sell on uh, that is still current as well in terms of software support. So you will get more for it as a sell-on. That would be my advice. But if you have a question that you would like me to answer in a future show, all you need to do is, there's a comment section. That's what you do. There's a comment section down there. Ask me any questions you want. Use the hashtag iCaveAnswers. If you use that hashtag, I will know that you are happy with me reading it out on the show with your name. If you don't want me to read it out on the show, then all you need to do is just ask me a question without putting hashtag iCaveAnswers, and I will answer it in the comments for you, because that's the kind of guy I am. Thank you all so much for watching, and we will see you in the next one. But remember, it's going to be later than normal.